Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be going ahead and jumping right back into AI code. Specifically, we're going to be working on enabling ragdolls and having some death states for our little crawly boys here. We're also going to be creating some code that will make the ragdolls dissolve into a particle effect that'll look pretty good in execution and we'll go ahead and clean up all the corpses whenever we're done killing them. So let's go ahead and hop into that and let's have a look around. So I did a couple changes. You can see the cultist prefab, the skeleton 3D for it, has has all of the IK still and still the physical bone for the chest bone, but all the other physical bones have been removed. And this is because we're going to be going in a direction where we have a ragdoll spawned in that replaces the animated body, as opposed to just trying to make the animated body ragdoll in place, as there were some slight issues with the bone poses based off of the way I was moving all of the bones with the code. So this is just the easiest way to do it. So speaking of which, we went ahead and created a ragdoll mesh, and this mesh has all of the physical bones for the body and you do that just by selecting the skeleton 3d and creating physical skeleton now for each one what i ended up doing besides the spine 003 which is our root bone all of them have a six degrees of freedom joint and if we go ahead and hide all of them except for this bone right here, you can see the arcs here define the constraints. That's the reason why I ended up going with six degrees of freedom because it allows you to use joint constraints on them and have a lot of flexibility here. So for example, right here, if we set the upper and lower limits to say 45 degrees, you can see now this joint will bend this way on the top and this way on the bottom. And that just lets you go ahead and set up the entire skeleton however you like. Now the constraints themselves are kind of on a case by case basis. So it'll depend on whatever your skeleton is, how you want to set them up. You'll have to go through them one at a time to go ahead and set them up. Now be aware if you're setting up two skeleton bones at the same time by multi-selecting on the left hand side and you manipulate them, sometimes they go the same way and sometimes they're inverted. So be aware of that when you're working with your skeleton to make sure you don't end up with undesirable results. Something else is you'll notice that there are no actual bones for the fingers. I'm just going to go ahead and set those up via code and I'm not going to worry about making them animated. And then the hand itself has a collider on just the hand bone. And that's pretty much it for the ragdoll, nothing too complicated. Now we did end up updating the shader on the mesh. And originally we were using the standard material, so we went ahead and created a new shader that's almost identical to it in result. The only real difference being the alpha channel, as we're now wanting a dissolve effect. So if we drag the dissolve weight right here, you can see the body just fades away and the back side of the mesh is also highlighted in light color. Now this is a three dimensional noise texture that's fading this away, so it's based off of world space. and for that to work, what we ended up doing was taking the vertex, we multiply it by the inverse view matrix, which goes ahead and gets our world space for the vertex. And then we just subtract from it the node world position, and that goes ahead and gets in local space. And we pass that in as the UVW for the dissolve texture. The end result on that is a three dimensional noise texture. And then we step through that using the dissolve weight with a subtract and an add node of 0.1. Speaking of which, you'll notice that the dissolve weight goes all the way down to negative 0.1 and positive 1.1. This is so that the blend can go all all the way from complete zero to complete one without having any little bits that are partially faded away at zero because of the blending. I did also go ahead and handle the back facing there so that way the geometry that's faced away from the body still has something on the back side of it. And we also pass that into the emission with a little bit of an offset so that it looks like it's evaporating. Now in addition to this what we're going to end up doing is in a couple locations on the body say the thighs the arms and the torso we're going to spawn particle effects that are attached to the body. Now these are based Based off of the temple particle effects but I just kind of condense them down into a single location and they're in world space so as the arms flail around or what have you the emission point will follow but the particles themselves will just be in world space and that's ideal specifically for particles on a AI that's flying through the air so that's pretty much all we're going to do on all of that now we do need to go ahead and modify the cultist AI to handle the spawning of the ragdoll so let's go ahead and dive into that so first off we're going to create a new export category for the health settings and we're going to create two new fillet variables, one for the max health and one for damage per shot. Normally, I'd go ahead and attach this to the weapon that's firing, but considering this project only has one weapon, it just made sense to make it simpler to put it here. But in the future, if you're working on your own project, you may very well want to attach that to the gun and then just pass that through the damage function. Now, besides that, we are going to go ahead and make a reference to our rollerball here, and we're just going to be using this to impart velocity into the ragdoll based off of wherever the AI is currently moving. And speaking of which, we're going to need a reference to the base skeleton 
that's going to be this skeleton right here, as well as a reference to the ragdoll scene, which will actually be spawning. Now, there is one private variable that's not an export that we need reference to, and that's going to be the current health. Now, the current health is going to be defaulted to the max health in the ready function, so we're going to go ahead and add that right there. Now, in addition to that, we do need to go ahead and create our on damage function that's going to be using the signal from the damageable node down here. That signal from the damageable passes the hit location, the force, as well as an aggressor body node. If we select that right here, you can see the on damageable signal here. So we're just going to be taking those nodes. And first off, we're going to go ahead and set our current target equal to the aggressor body node. If the AI isn't already aggressor towards the player, if they do shoot them, we do want to go ahead and automatically set the AI to be aggressive. And then we're also going to set the current health minus equals damage per shot. Now, if the current health is less than or equal to zero, we need to go ahead and handle on death. Now, on death is going to be taking the hit location and the force so that that way it can whip the ragdoll around it when the AI dies based off of where we shot them so let's create that function we're going to be passing in the hit location and force which are both vector threes and what this function is going to be doing is basically spawning a ragdoll setting all of the bone positions to whatever the current skeleton's bone positions are adding the force of the roller ball which is the direction we're currently traveling and then adding the force of the hit location to the bone that is closest to the hit location so that's a lot of stuff but we're going to just tackle them one at a time let's go ahead and create our new ragdoll we're going to use the ragdoll scene dot instantiate as node 3d we're going to add that to the parent of this node so probably that'll be the scene node but if you happen to spawn your ai into a container node or something like that this will be in that container next up we're going to go ahead and get our skeleton in the actual ragdoll scene this won't be the topmost node as you can see if you select the cultist ragdoll scene over here on the left you have the cultist cultist rig and then the skeleton 3d so what we're going to do is we're going to create a function that's just going to recursively go through the hierarchy until it finds the first skeleton 3d and then it's going to return that skeleton in 3d so let's go ahead and create that we're going to call this function retrieve skeleton it's going to take a node as its parameter and it's going to return a skeleton 3d and this node is going to be recursive so what that means is that it will take a node it will check to see if it's a skeleton if it is it'll just return that but if it's not it will call the same function on all the children of that node so first off we check to see if it's a skeleton if it is we just return it and if it's not it's going to go through all the children of this node and then it's going to call this function on those children and if that returns is not null then it knows that it found the skeleton and it'll just return that so it'll kind of go down the hierarchy and once it finds one it'll ricochet back up with the skeleton and if it doesn't find anything it goes ahead and returns null and that way for any of the children that aren't the skeleton they will all return null until it does find one and so we can just call this function on the highest node in the new ragdoll scene and it will return a skeleton now, first off, before we do anything, if the skeleton returns null, then that means that there wasn't a skeleton in the node that you just spawned and it wasn't properly set up. So we're going to go ahead and print an error and then we're just going to return. Now, if the skeleton is not equal to null, we're good to go ahead and continue. And we're just going to set the new ragdoll's global position and rotation to whatever the base skeleton's global position and rotation is, as well as the found skeleton's global position and rotation, as the cultist ragdoll's base node and the actual skeleton node 3D may be in different positions. And this just ensures that whatever skeleton you use for your project will go ahead and work properly. Now, next up, we need to go ahead and set all of our bone positions. So we can use the found skeleton .get bone count, and we can iterate through this and just set Set each of the found skeletons bone positions based off that index to the get bone position based off that index of the base skeleton and this should iterate through every bone that's in the skeleton hierarchy and set them to the exact position and rotation of their base skeletons bone positions and rotations now we can go ahead and start our physical bone simulation this will go ahead and start the ragdoll simulation and now we can go ahead and apply the forces before we do that we're going to create a couple new variables and it's going to be the closest bone as well as the closest distance as we're iterating through all of the physical physical bones in the ragdoll to set their velocity, we can go ahead and simultaneously check to see which one is closest to the hit location by checking it against the closest distance, which we default to infinity to begin with. So whichever bone it selects first, this would be spine 003, it will automatically select that one as the closest distance and then iterate through seeing if any one are less than that. So for that, we're going to create a new for loop. We're going to use the found skeleton get children. And for each one of them first, we're going to just check to see if they're a physical bone 3D. If they're not, we need to just continue. But if they are, we're going to go ahead and apply the impulse based off the roller balls linear velocity. Following that, we can go ahead and get our distance between that and the hit location, which we passed in, which is wherever the bullet from our player hit them. And if that distance is less than the current closest distance, which remember starts out as infinity, but goes down from there, then we go ahead and set the closest distance and closest bone to this distance and this bone. 
And just below that, we can go ahead and check to see if the closest bone does not equal null, which it would only equal null if there was some sort of issue with our skeleton. Then we go ahead and apply the impulse based off the force location and the force power. And last but not least, we can go ahead and call the QFree function on this node, which will go ahead and completely delete the cultist prefab. We can go ahead and save this and we're good to go. We can set the ragdoll scene to the cultist ragdoll scene that I created, as well as the base skeleton to the skeleton 3D and the rollerball to the rollerball. We can set our max health and damage per shot to the same thing. That way we can just use it once. That way we can just shoot them once to test. And let's go ahead and test those ragdolls. So if we go over to our level one scene, make sure that nothing reset randomly. And we can leave that as defaults and we can leave those as defaults across the board and go ahead and hit play and see what it looks like. All right, we're in game and we see the AI moving around over there. We wait for a second and we go ahead and shoot him. You can see it now ragdolls properly. And that's going to be pretty much it. Obviously, the ragdoll looks a little bit awkward at the moment. I think he's a little bit large. Let's double check that real quick. Yeah, see, I had set the scale incorrectly on the skeleton prior to this, trying to resolve the scale, but I ended up just editing it in the blender. Be aware of something. You can't resize ragdolls in Godot. There is just no support for it currently. So anytime you want the ragdoll to be a different size or something, you have to modify the mesh itself and the, the actual scale of the mesh. So I went ahead and modified that already. Something to just be aware of going forward. So let's go ahead and hit play and see how that looks. All right, so we got another round. We look at our AI. If we go ahead and shoot him, yeah, that looks much more accurate. So that's now identical to the base level model. And that looks pretty good. So now we can go ahead and make it dissolve properly. Now, it looks a little bit awkward the way it's lying, but be aware that this will only be seen by the players for a couple seconds before it dissolves. So let's go ahead and get the dissolve function working. So if we go up to where the enemies is, we can create a new script. And first, we're going to need a couple exports. So let's go ahead and create two floats. And the first one is going to be the max random delay. This is the maximum amount of time that it will wait before starting the dissolve. And then we have dissolve duration, which is the amount of time that it will actually take to properly completely dissolve. Now, be aware when you're making your particles to make them to work within that time frame. I made my particles last for about three seconds, but they mostly start out right at the beginning and then they kind of trickle off and the end result looks pretty good. Now, beyond that, we do need an array of the dissolved meshes, and this is going to be any mesh with that instance shader variable for dissolve weight as we'll be iterating through each of those during our process function to set all of the shader parameters to the correct shader parameter. Then we're also going to need a pack scene reference and that's going to be the dissolved particles that we're actually spawning and we're going to be spawning them on several of the joints in order to make them move around with the AI as it flies through the air or what have you. So we're going to need an array to the dissolved spawn points and in my case this is going to be the spine as well as the thigh left and right and the upper arm left and right. Then we're going to need a couple private variables and the first one's going to be a fade delay and this one's going to be counting down from a random number between zero and the max random delay. And then the fade current is going to be counting up from zero to one and it's going to be added to based off of the dissolved duration. We'll get to that in just a moment. We go ahead and create a boolean that just tells us that we have already spawned the particles. That way we only spawn the particles once after the delay is done, but right before we start the dissolve. And we need a reference to all those particles so that if the body happens to disappear before the particles are done, emitting and floating through the air, then we need to go ahead and make them actually detach from the body before deleting the body so that that way they don't disappear randomly. So first off, let's go ahead and create a new random number generator in the ready function. Let's set our fade delay from zero to max random delay, just a random number between those two. And in the process function, we'll just go ahead and check to see if our delay is currently greater than zero. And if it is, we're going to subtract delta from it. Now, if it isn't greater than zero, first off, we're going to check to see if we have already spawned the particles. And if we have not, we're going to set that to true and create a for loop, which is going to go through all of the dissolved spawn points. So in my case, there'll be about five of them. And for each one, we're going to create a new particles, which is just going to be the dissolved particles to instantiate as GPU particles 3D. And we're going to use the point dot add child function with the particles to go ahead and add it to whatever that spawn point is. We'll set the global position and rotation to the spawn points position and rotation. And then we're going to go ahead and start emitting as well as restart the particles. I found there were some slight issues with the particles not restarting properly when instantiated. So just be aware to go ahead and call that to be on the safe side. And finally, we're going to add them to our spawn particles cache, which is just that array up here. 
And before we finish our for loop, we're gonna go ahead and create a new scene tree timer using the get tree create timer with a time that is the particle's lifetime multiplied by two, just so that we're on the safe side so that all the particles have died by then. And we're gonna divide it by the particles.speed scale. Then we're just going to use the timeout signal on that. We're gonna to connect to that the particles.qfree.bind function. And this is just going to make sure that whenever the particles are done, whenever that timer has run out, it'll go ahead and delete those particles. Now we can actually get to the fading function. Now for the fade current, remember it's gonna be going from zero to one. We're going to add to it delta divided by the dissolved duration. That way, if the dissolved duration is three seconds, it will add to it very slowly up to three seconds. Then we're gonna use a remap function to remap that from zero to one to negative 0.1 to positive 1.1. Because remember our instance shader variable here doesn't go from a clean zero to one, it goes from negative 0.1 to 1.1. So we need to go ahead and map that in the actual script. And then for all the dissolved meshes, in this case, just the cultist mesh and the cultist size mesh, we're gonna set the instance shader variable called dissolve weight to our current mapped fate. And finally, if the current fade is greater than or equal to one, then we know we have completely faded away and we can go ahead and queue free the ragdoll. Now, before we queue free the ragdoll, we are going to want to go through all of the particles and we're first going to check to see if the instance is valid of the particles. That means it hasn't been deleted yet. And if it is, we're gonna take the particles and get the parent and then remove those particles from the parent. This will just go ahead and detach them out into the scene and then they will no longer be attached to anything. Then we're going to use the get parent function of this node, which will just be the scene node or the container for your AI. And we're gonna to add to it the particles node. This will just make sure that if the particles haven't completed animating yet, if your particles happen to be longer than mine or what have you, then the particles will go ahead and complete their animation before being deleted inevitably by the scene tree timer that we created earlier. And that should be good to go. So if we go over to the cultist ragdoll, we can add that script. And we've got a couple things that we need to set up. First off, let's add the two meshes. That'll be the cultist mesh as well as the cultist eyes mesh. We can leave the max random delay to two and the dissolve duration to three, but let's go ahead and add our dissolve particles. And I called them flower death particles. And then we also need our dissolve points. So let's go ahead and add five of these. And this will be the spine 003, as well as the left and right thigh and the left and right upper arm. I just found that these nodes looked the best. If you add more than this, it will look better. It'll be more accurate, but it will also require more performance. And I found this just looked fine. So if we go ahead and save that and go back to play, we can go ahead and see it in action. So if we go ahead and shoot our AI, there's a slight delay and then the particles just evaporate and the AI is deleted. And that's pretty much it. Now it'll be a little bit random. Sometimes it'll be a little bit shorter. Sometimes it'll be a little bit longer. That one was actually quite short. And depending on the situation, you may want it longer or shorter. So all those variables are exposed. So you can set them to whatever you want. But that's gonna be pretty much it for today. Next week, we're gonna be working on making the AI crawl on the ceiling. And I'm very excited for that. And as well as making them work a little bit better when they're in the air. So if we do shoot them and they do happen to have more health than just one, then we do wanna go ahead and kick them back and handle that in air action as well as making them jump at the player and jump through the environment. So we're gonna be working on all of that next week. We'll see how far we get. And whenever we're done with that, we're gonna be moving on to audio. But for now, this will be it. Thank you all for watching as always. I hope you all had a wonderful New Year's and a wonderful holidays. And we'll see you all back here next week for the next tutorial.